it's still going to say zero. Asby. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Philip Bloom. I'm the June and Simon Casey Lee Curator of the Chinese Garden and the Director of the Center for East Asian Garden Studies at the Huntington. Um, welcome to Symbiotic Beauty, the Sustainable Wisdom of Samurai Residences, um, a talk by our speaker, Asby Brown. Um, as m many of you are probably aware, this is our first in-person East Asian Gardens lecture since February of 2020. Um, I'm delighted. Yeah, <laughs> I'm delighted that it's happening in person. But I'm also delighted we learned something from the pandemic, which is that if we do things online, hundreds of people have access to it. So it's also being it's also our first time doing a live broadcast of a lecture on YouTube, um, and a recording of the talk will also be made available through our website. Um, so I'd like to thank David and Mikey for making it possible to do this hybrid event for the first time. And I'd also like to thank um, Frank and Toshie Mosier for underwriting this and several of our other events to come. Um, please take a moment to silence your electronic devices and also please take note of the three emergency exits marked in red in case something remarkable happens. Um, this fall has been an unusually active and busy time for the Asian Gardens team at the Huntington. Within the past two months, uh, three major projects in the gardens have opened. The projects include an exhibition, paintings in print, studying art in China, which is on view in the Chinese Garden Gallery until May. Um, there's a new Chinese medicinal garden that actually was just planted yesterday, thanks to Michelle Bailey. 
and the Japanese Heritage Shoya House, which opened about a month ago. These are all projects that have been developed in relation to the Huntington's strategic plan, which lays out the priorities for everything that we do in the institution. Among these priorities are ensuring the accessibility of our collections, which is actually something that's thematized in our show, Paintings in Print. It's a show about how knowledge of Chinese painting was spread to new audiences, and in particular, new social classes, through the medium of color printed books in the 17th and 18th centuries. It's a show that draws almost exclusively from our own collection, and it seeks to open new aspects of that collection to visitors. But it also looks at how the sharing of knowledge can spur developments in arts, like printing and painting. And those are precisely the sorts of developments that we hope that opening our collection may also spur. The Chinese Medicinal Garden and the Shoya House, meanwhile, are both projects that are deeply engaged with ideas of sustainability, one of the other pillars of our strategic plan. At their core, the projects are devoted to the examination of human relationships to plants, a relationship that lies, of course, obviously, at the heart of all societies, but that has in many ways been increasingly ignored in recent decades. Both projects deal with practices of conservation and preservation, the conservation of rare plant species, the preservation of historical architecture, and the perpetuation of historical crafts. And as we'll hear today, the Shoya House in particular may even offer, offer some inspiration for how we can engage more responsibly with nature and the plant world as we look toward the future. These two projects will be the focus of our East Asian Gardens lectures over the next two years. This year is devoted to the Shoya House and next year to Chinese medicinal plants. So um, please mark your calendars for March 28th uh, of 2024 when Yukio Lippet will address the Shoya's place in the history of Japanese architecture, and April 18th when David Howell will speak about practices of recycling and repurposing in Edo period Japan. Around the Gregorian and Lunar New Year's, we're going to have a brief interlude for our annual Japanese tea lecture on January 18th with Bruce Hamana. And on February 8th, I'm going to speak about a new Chinese painting that the Huntington recently acquired. With that as some background for today's talk, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Asby Brown. Asby is a leading authority on Japanese architecture, design, and environmentalism. He's the author of a number of books, including The Very Small Home, Just Enough, Lessons in Living Green from Traditional Japan, and The Genius of Japanese Carpentry. He majored in fine art and architecture at Yale, and then he pursued graduate studies in architecture and engineering at the University of Tokyo. He's been living in Japan for nearly 40 years, working as a faculty member at the Kanazawa Institute of Technology, while also pursuing independent work as an artist and writer. In 2003, he founded um, the Kanazawa Institute of Technology Future Design Institute, which focuses on cognitive and cultural issues surrounding the human hand and its use in the creative process. He's conducted collaborative research with neuroscientists and perceptual psychologists. And since the March uh, 2011 nuclear disaster in Fukushima, he's also been extensively involved in reporting and advocacy on the scientific and social consequences of that ongoing tragedy. Asby's work may be familiar to many of you. Um, he spoke virtually in our lecture series about a little more than a year ago, and his book, Just Enough, was one of the major inspirations for our Shoya House project. Copies of several of his books are available in the lobby, and he'll be available to sign them after the talk and Q&A. Um, just one brief note for our online viewers. Um, please post your questions into the comment or chat box at any time, and after the talk, I'll post them to Asby as we're circulating the microphone for questions from the audience. So please join me in welcoming Asby Brown. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I haven't been in Los Angeles for about 10 years, uh, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say this was my first time to visit the Huntington. Well, actually, it was yesterday. Uh, so uh, I was very excited to hear about this project uh, to uh, move the Shoya House from Maragame here and uh, to make it into kind of a center for education and thinking about sustainability, about integration of the built environment and the natural environment 
et cetera. So um, yeah, I prepared a presentation uh, that will try to put that house in, in context, uh, you know, historically, socially, uh, technologically. So here we go. Um, yeah, so uh, how many of you have visited the Shoya house already? Great, almost, almost everyone. Um, I can't stress how unusual it is to have a house of this quality uh, and historical significance moved outside of Japan. It happens sometimes within Japan uh, to you know, various architectural museums, etc. But this is a very, very unusual project. Um, it's called the Yokoi House because the, the Yokoi family uh, had lived in it, owned it for, for several centuries, and it was built around uh, 1700. This is, of course, as it has been reconstructed here at the Huntington. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I got here. In other words, you know, what led me to this interest in uh, Japanese carpentry, uh, et cetera. I'm, a, I'm from New Orleans, and I think uh, growing up in New Orleans really uh, shaped my viewpoint, my, my sensibility about uh, the environment, about towns, about cities, about buildings, about what makes them uh, wonderful, how they speak to us, about aging, about continuity, uh, about the diversity of cultural languages. And, um, you know, I went to university at Yale, and I was very surprised when I got there that not everyone loved their hometown. Uh, I figure everyone in New Orleans does, but it was kind of surprising that people really didn't. Um, I uh, studied architecture, I studied fine art, uh, I became very interested in woodcraft, particularly joinery, uh, what's now known as timber framing. Uh, in, in happens a lot in America. It was just beginning to be revived and sort of reverse engineered at the time, the late 1970s, uh, because it had uh, stopped being practiced in the 19th century, basically. Uh, with a few exceptions, but in Japan, it had continued uh, as an unbroken tradition, and I was amazed. Uh, this was one book by Kiyoshi Seke, one of the only things available in the late 70s about this sort of thing, the art of Japanese joinery, and I would look at these beautiful black and white photos, so just astounded, and wanted to come to Japan to, to learn about that. There were also other books in um, the library at Yale about Japanese architecture, both contemporary and historical, including this book by uh, Teiji Ito with photographs by F uh, Futagawa Yukio, an uh, astounding survey of Japanese uh, minka, farmhouses, and that ha also had a very, very strong influence on me. Uh, it took a few years for me to get to Japan, actually, but in uh, 1983, I was able to go uh, and visit um, for, uh, basically, I have worked for about a week and stayed for about a month, and uh, ended up uh, making contact with uh, the last great, what I think is the last great temple carpenter who was working on restoring Yakuji Temple uh, in Nara, which was, you know, built in basically, uh, you know, the 8th century, um, rather 700. And uh, his name is uh, Tsunakazu Nishioka, and he passed away in the mid-90s. Um, I initially thought I wanted to be a, an apprentice carpenter and actually learn the craft, but I was already in my late 20s and uh, had my own creative work that I wanted to do, and I understood that that was not going to be possible. If I did that, I would have to be like obedient for seven or eight years, uh, and I didn't think I had that temperament. But instead, I asked him to allow me to document the work, to give me access to the site, and I ended up spending three years in total uh, documenting uh, this reconstruction process, uh, and uh, that's me. I, you know, <laughs> very young. I had hair under the uh, helmet, and I was a lot skinnier than I am now. Uh, but it was in heaven. I was absolutely in heaven, and. Uh, uh, doing it as a labor of love and learning a lot uh, as I did that, um, you know, how to draw details of these sorts of buildings, etc. And it became a book called uh, The Genius of Japanese Carpentry, which actually I published while I was still getting my master's degree uh, back in 1988. And uh, uh, a new edition was published in 2014. And well, you know, it's not a too much of a sales bill, but it's, a, it's in the lobby if you want to see it and maybe get a signed copy. Um, the thing is that um, as I s spent time observing and learning from Master Nishioka, I realized that the most important things were the invisibles, uh, the things that really were about uh, what's happening internally, uh, the internal process, internal sensibility of the carpenter, um, our own sensibilities, uh, how we know things, how we experience things. And uh, it, it struck me as a very, very different uh, you know, way of understanding from what I had uh, learned, you know, certainly growing up in the U.S., and, and certainly through my education. And one of the most remarkable things was a sense of time, specifically thinking in terms of thousand-year lifespans. And uh, 
uh, I don't know, a thousand year time span. So, for instance, the trees used in the original construction of Yakushiji, as well as other temples like Horyuji uh, in Nara, were basically a thousand years old when they were cut to be used originally in the construction in the 700s. Uh, and those buildings survived for 1,300 years already uh, and could continue for a much longer time. And Master Nishioka. Uh, thought about that. He was thinking, how can I make a building that will last a thousand years? Uh, and in that context, the human lifespan was almost nothing. Uh, so that actually um, was sort of a delayed, you know, uh, consciousness explosion. Uh, I realized much later, I was like, oh my God, he really is thinking a thousand years. And we rarely have anyone now in our culture who's thinking in those terms. Um, to think about Japan and, and some things I find to be very special about it, well, in our society, uh, we're very specialized and things like you know, water, forestry, energy, waste, or food. Uh, we consider these to be very separate fields, generally. Uh, and you can you know, basically get a degree in you know, uh, energy and not have to think anything about food, or learn anything about food. Or uh, you, could learn about, you could get a degree in forestry and not really need to know anything about waste. But in fact, they're all interconnected in, in very complex and dynamic ways. And I think the people of Japan, particularly in the Edo period, as they struggled with their resource shortages and uh, the limitations of their environment uh, and a sort of impending uh, environmental uh, degradation, uh, they had an empirical understanding of these interactions and were able to capitalize on that understanding to make sort of mutually reinforcing solutions. And it was what we would call system thinking, systems thinking today. Uh, it was, again, empirical. They, we can't say that they were scientific in the way we were, but they were looking at the interactions and trying to find solutions that uh, really took good account of the complexity. Um, Something else that has become uh, more apparent to me more recently is um, that the Japanese system of uh, material provision, energy use, uh, environmental management uh, are almost ideal in terms of sustainability as we think of it today. Uh, and particularly uh, something we call circularity or the circular economy. Uh, and maybe uh, some people maybe don't know that, but uh, you know our current uh, material process production system is called take, make, dispose. So that means you know you. Uh, get the resources, you take, uh, you make something, manufacturing, you use it, uh, and then you dispose of it. Almost everything we use eventually becomes landfill or gets incinerated. Uh, and this is in inherently wasteful. Uh, it has large implications for, uh, you know, energy consumption, for pollution, for uh, the, the, again, the uh, loss of resources uh, of many kinds. Uh, the circular economy or circularity takes that arrow, that vector, and bends it into a loop. Uh, and uh, basically, it has some of the same characteristics. You collect the resources. Uh, hopefully, uh, you will use a lot of biological inputs, things like wood, things like uh, natural fibers, uh, living things which are inherently renewable uh, and, and restorable. Uh, of course, there will be some non-renewable inputs, uh, some kinds of energy sources, some minerals, some uh, metals, etc., which you know will, will probably be unavoidable to use. Uh, we would like to use them in a way, for instance, that uses renewable energy for every aspect of the production. Uh, and then we have the make phase, of course, the manufacturing, uh, which is trying to use less energy, trying to produce less waste. And then the distribution phase, which, you know, we tend to underestimate how um, much energy and how wasteful that is and the impacts of that. As we know, uh, everything we use comes from far away, basically, to unless you make an, a, a concerted effort to source things locally. Uh, and then we have the use phase. Uh, then finally, you know, uh, rather than recycling as we think of things, I mean, if you recycle most things, uh, like plastic bottles or, or paper, you can't make another plastic bottle or paper of the same quality. You can only make a lower quality uh, product and ultimately that ends up as landfill or gets incinerated uh, with all of those problems. Uh, but there are a few things, a few kinds of materials that can be upcycled. In other words, put back into this production loop at the top as raw material to produce the same kind of things. Of course, metals uh, generally can do that. Uh, glass often lends itself to that. And there are others, and there's a great um, kind of uh, research going on to find more materials that have this uh, possibility. Uh, but of course, as we're upcycling, we want to do it in a way that will regenerate natural capital. And of course, natural capital are things like the healthy forest, the healthy ocean, um, you know, things that are providing food, things that are providing other natural services, protecting the watershed, etc. So this is a key, the regeneration is the key. Uh, 
beyond that, there are loops uh, in, in every other, um, we want to minimize waste, of course, but perhaps it'll never totally go away, but there are other uh, loops to reuse things, to repair them, uh, to redistribute things. For instance, if you go bring your clothes to the Salvation Army, that's a kind of redistribution, uh, or to recondition things, and more and more manufacturers are uh, designing products, uh, appliances, automobiles, that uh, can be more easily reconditioned, sort of modular designs where you swap out one component and then replace that, and that can actually uh, be something that can go back onto the market to be used. Um, and this whole thing is called a circularity. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it's not a totally new idea. This really integrates uh, several streams of thought that have been brewing for, for uh, decades. Um, something called Cradle to Cradle by uh, William McDonough uh, and uh, his partner Brangart, who talk about you know this upcycle thing and uh, the blue economy. Um, again, systems thinking. There's a lot of things that have fed into this, but it sort of coalesced about 10 years ago. Uh, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in particular funded a lot of research that pointed the way and is uh, now actively persuading businesses. And there's a lot of government buy-in, particularly in Europe, uh, not so much here in the U.S. or in Japan. And again, the key points, you know, is to maximize use and minis minimize waste. Uh, one is dematerialization, use less material, modularity, make designs that are modular so you can swap parts out easily and replace them. Product life extension, make sure things are built to last and have ways to, con you know, to refurbish them so they can last even longer. And finally, you don't need things for everything. Some things can be provided as services rather than products. Uh, and, you know, uh, this is pretty much what Japanese of the Edo period did as a matter of course. Almost all of this. It's a different context, different technologies, but this thinking was very, very similar. And we see this reflected in the Shoya house and in other aspects of Japanese lifestyle, particularly of the Edo period. So, you know, what we think about now is, you know, how can this help us today? What can we learn from this? And this is something I've been focusing on for quite a few years. Um, perhaps most of you are familiar with the Edo period. It was the uh, 250 years or so immediately preceding the um, opening of Japan to the West and to industrialization in 1868, began in the, right around 1600, 1603. Uh, this is a wonderful print by Hokusai uh, of Edo, uh, the Sumida River Edo, which was renamed Tokyo in 1868 when the Emperor Meiji was brought from Kyoto to that city to make it the capital. Uh, and the people are using the boat, you know, they used boats like taxis, like buses. Uh, it was a beautiful environment. You could see Mount Fuji uh, from the city, uh, and there was great bridges and great structures as well. Um, so this period, when it began, um, it, it followed two centuries of terrible war uh, within the country, uh, the Sengoku period, and uh, uh, basic deforestation was very, very widespread and was leading to um, incredible problems, sort of domino effect of the, the deforestation leading to landslides, which would silt up rivers, which um, you know damage the fish, and maybe also lead to unpredictable flooding, uh, which could then damage agricultural fields, which could lead to famine. It's just falling dominoes uh, effect uh, and uh, sort of a vicious cycle. But they managed to reverse it. Uh, within, let's say, one generation or maybe two generations, uh, by the, the middle uh, or the end of the, the, of the uh, 1600s, they had uh, developed uh, regenerative forestry. They had found ways to uh, replace the trees to restore the health of the forest, understanding that the forest was center to everything. That that was absolutely, you know, if the forest wasn't uh, healthy, then nothing else would be. And the first thing was to gather information. Uh, find out what was happening, and they did it by conducting a census of trees, literally throughout the country, sending teams of people, usually samurai who were educated and uh, you know were numerically literate, uh, and and people from the villages who knew the forest and knew the region, and they would count the trees and figure out which areas needed to be protected, uh, which ones could be logged safely, uh, which ones needed to be left for a short time, and even passed laws such as um, uh, the death penalty for entering certain forests that were designated protected for entering them carrying an axe or a cutting tool. Uh, it doesn't seem that, there's no record that that penalty was ever actually administered, but it was definitely a law on the books. Uh, and key to me, uh, and certainly in the modern age, is the fact that the citizens played an important role in monitoring the environment and using it ethically. And it was, uh, there were quite a lot of ethical uh, constraints and guidelines that pervaded the society, uh, and many of which continue to today and make Japan uh, a great place to live. Um, Edo period society was a caste society with a strong social hierarchy. Uh, and I don't know that many of us would want to live there. Uh, at the top were the samurai. They were a warrior caste. 
Uh, and they had uh, a history of having been basically farmers and people living in rural areas and coming together to help their local lord when necessary. In the Edo period, um, people were forced to choose. Either they would be a samurai or they would be a farmer. Uh, and uh, and uh, a small number, uh, basically 10% of the population, became samurai. Um, the peasants were 80% of the population. Those were farmers, basically. Uh, and they were living in rural villages. Uh, below them were artisans. This is in terms of status. Peasants had a higher status uh, than artisans or merchants. Merchants were considered pretty low because they were motivated by money and, and wealth. Um, certain classes were outside of this uh, structure, the hierarchy, but still had status. The emperor, the imperial family, the remaining uh, aristocrats, they weren't part of this, but they certainly had status. The clerics would have status based on their patronage. There were uh, you know, prostitutes and entertainers, again, depending on their patronage, and there were outcasts and others. Uh, interesting thing is that um, a shoya which is a village headman, and the kind, uh, the family like the Yokois, who were the shoya uh, of a village in uh, Marugame, um, they were sort of between samurai and farmers. Um, many of them were sort of farmers who had been elevated uh, to a more honorary position, sort of quasi or honorary samurai. Some, like the Yokois, as I understand, were sort of, you know, had been a higher status and became headmen in the process of, of going to a lower status, a slightly lower status. Uh, so they're sort of in the middle. Um, the political structure was also very interesting and led, had a lot of advantages for how uh, things could be administered and made productive. Um, it was called the Baku Han system. Baku is Bakufu, that's the shogun and the shogunal government which was centered in Edo. And Han are the uh, provinces, the feudal domains which were around the country. Um, and uh, there were some provinces that were directly administered by the shogunate. Uh, there were quite a few that were much more uh, independent and had autonomy. They were responsible, they were underneath and uh, had loyalty to the central government, to the shogun, but they had a lot of autonomy. And this autonomy made it possible for them all to find local solutions. Uh, and the, um, the Yokoi family in Maragame, that was a Maragame Hang, Maragame uh, domain, uh, which is in Shikoku. I'll show you a map in a minute. In terms of village government, um, there was uh, three people who had positions of responsibility, key officials. One was the Shoya, which again, like the Yokoi family. Other names depends on the region, sometimes historically, sometimes they're called Nanushi, sometimes uh, Kimoidi. Uh, there's something called the Kumigashira, which was sort of an assistant uh, group leader, sometimes called Toshiyori. Uh, there's a Hyakushodai, uh, also called Goningumi Gashira, who was really more of a representative of the peasants themselves. Goningumi is these groups of five families, five households, and that was one of the organizing uh, principles. Uh, and above these, uh, the Shoya, for instance, was the Ojoya. Often, uh, many places, there was someone above them who would like administer five or more uh, villages and sort of monitor and, and, uh, and uh, basically manage the, the Shoya. Um, Again, there were a lot of villages. Most people lived in villages. There were about 70,000 of them, and 80% of the population were farmers living there. Uh, in terms of lifestyle, uh, it's kind of interesting. If you've been to Japan and you look at the buildings, there is a, a lot of similarity, even though you know you have urban and rural populations and lifestyles. Um, again, in terms of the, the rural population, uh, most of them are farmers, but also often fishermen uh, fall into this category. Uh, woodsmen, people who are you know cutting lumber, etc., they fall into this category. And they're sort of sharing the environment in many ways and sharing the lifestyle. Commoners, you know, they're mainly, uh, in the urban population, mainly commoners. Uh, there's a lot of samurai as well, particularly in a town like Edo, a uh, large percentage of the population. And then the monks and the priests, etc., as well. Uh, but they're separate lifestyles, but a lot of shared characteristics and how things were built and uh, the environment that they created. Uh, just to go quickly, in terms of lifestyle of commoners, such as merchants or townspeople, um, you know, they're, they lived in what was called machia generally in the town. It's like a townhouse. Machiya literally means townhouse. Uh, this is in Kawagoe, which is outside of Tokyo, which is one of the places where these houses are best preserved. There's almost nothing like this in Tokyo left. I mean, earthquakes, war, etc. They've all been destroyed, but uh, generally they're built right on the street. Uh, ground floor would be a shop. They're living behind and upstairs. These are particularly fine examples that were built to be fireproof with these thick fireproof plaster walls, but most people you know, maybe didn't live in those. They had to be fairly prosperous to have that uh, in the town of Edo in uh, 
basically the urban blocks had these townhouses, these machia, along the street front, and in the middle were what's called nagaya, which were tenement houses, one-room apartments, about 10 of them. Uh, basically, one of these, uh, uh, the, the landowners probably lived in one of these houses and rented these out to people, and it was a very communal lifestyle, uh, but the key is that they were one-room apartments, uh, very, very minimal, and these weren't slums. These were, uh, you know, considered appropriate even for, um, you know, uh, people, you know, professionals, people with careers and crafts and who were actually, you know, earning a decent living. Uh, it simply was a lack of available space. And Nagaya comes to figure later because there's something called the Nagaya Mon. Uh, farmers uh, live in what we now call Minka, which literally, literally means folk house. Uh, there's many spectacular examples in Japan. Many more of these kind of houses than the urban ones, either of samurai or uh, townspeople. This is Shirakara Go, these uh, thatch roof houses called Gashozukuri, which means praying hands. It became a UNESCO go World Heritage, Heritage, Heritage Site. Um, uh, other examples are in, in situ or in museums like the Nihon Minka N in Kawasaki. This is one from Nagano from the 18th century called the Sasaki House. Uh, again, this one's thatch roofed. Um, these houses, um, you know, one of the key features is a large dirt floored space called the Doma, which was for work. Uh, the kitchen was usually in this dirt floor. It's really clay that's been pounded, mixed with lime. It's called tataki, but uh, called a doma. Uh, there was usually a very, very large wooden floored area, which was also used for work, uh, a kind of fire pit called the irori, where the family could gather. Um, often, if the family was wealthy enough, they could have rooms with tatami mats, which we call zashiki, reception rooms, et cetera, if they have a, enough uh, money and status. But basically, the, the uh, you know, farmhouses, you see, when you enter them, you see this large doma and a large wooden floored space and maybe some rooms in the back, and they're very, very smoky. Uh, and it's interesting because shoya houses uh, often have both characteristics, and I'll show you a few examples in a minute. Uh, typical Japanese farmstead includes, of course, a main house called an omoya. There's a, a yard, uh, usually it's called a niwa, which also means garden, but it also means yard. Uh, usually a pond. Uh, the trees are planted carefully, uh, you know, to protect from the wind uh, when necessary to provide uh, fruits and nuts, etc. Um, there might be a, a kitchen garden on site and then rice fields, which in this case I drew them very, very close, but sometimes they're at some distance, these uh, you know, terrace rice fields that are irrigated. And of course, the irrigation system itself is very, very important uh, and very well designed. Uh, if any of you who've been to Japan, you know it's very mountainous. There was not a lot of arable land. Uh, farmland was basically created by clearing forests from valley floors. Uh, and then turning them into uh, rice paddies uh, or other kinds of agricultural fields. Often the uh, farmsteads themselves are on the periphery. There are other, you know, different examples, of course, but usually they're using land that would not, uh, you know, that, that uh, without, it means that you're not using land that could be used for rice fields because rice is the most valuable crop. Uh, and then the surrounding forest, the hillsides, is called Satoyama, sort of like village mountain. And they're intensively used uh, for foraging, for food, you know, mushrooms and uh, wadabi ferns and all sorts of other edibles and also to gather fuel and firewood. And an example of this sort of ethical use of uh, like the forest or the guidelines that were in place for, for uh, uh, getting fuel. Uh, and wood was the primary fuel. In urban areas, they were using charcoal, which was generally created or burned by the, the people in the villages. But uh, one of the guidelines was that you could not cut a tree uh, to, to create fuel from it. You had to use what fell naturally. And this means that, you know, uh, for uh, people living, a community living in the same environment for hundreds of years, they understand clearly through that experience what the natural carrying capacity of that environment is in terms of fuel provision. Uh, and also, they were not allowed to, like, bring wagons and and, and animals and carts to, to carry it out. They had to cut it on site and carry it out on their backs, uh, which again imposes a, a sort of natural limit on that. So if there was a situation where someone wanted to make, say, a pottery or a smithy, a blacksmith shop, something that uses a lot of fuel, there would have to be quite a lot of discussion about whether or not there was enough uh, fuel available for everyone if that was done. Uh, and things were designed to maximize and economize on fuel. This is a commando uh, 
stove for the kitchen, a cook stove. This example has two fireboxes of different sizes. Sometimes they get much more elaborate with five or six or sometimes even more. Uh, at the Shoya house, there's one kamado that has a single pot. That was also not that unusual. And they're designed that these uh, iron pots have a lip that seals the edge of uh, you know, the opening uh, to prevent loss of heat. Uh, and they could burn anything. Of course, they could burn wood, but this could burn old sandals. It could burn twigs. It could burn you know, almost anything. Uh, and you could choose you know, the firebox of the appropriate size, not to use a bigger one if a smaller one would do, for instance. Uh, the design was very, very uh, efficient and very, very uh, beautiful in many ways. Um, another aspect had to do with monitoring uh, water. Uh, basically, and if at all possible, in almost every case, they uh, made their irrigation systems in a way that made use of the natural watershed. So the natural rivers and creeks, uh, natural holding ponds, of course they would bolster them, they would dig irrigation canals. Uh, there was a, quite a lot of engineering of that sort, but they were trying to maintain the health of the natural watershed as much as possible. Uh, and it's recent research has shown, for instance, that the water that comes out of these terrace rice fields is cleaner in terms of organic matter than the water that goes in, which is one of those wonderful principles that would be great if we maintained, uh, that whenever we use water for a factory or anything, our kitchens, it would be better if the water was cleaner after we were done with it. So um, again, I'm not suggesting we go back to the same technologies, but these principles, these solutions that recognize the integration of these many, many interconnected factors. Um, now to talk about samurai. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Yokoi family were samurai. And uh, they had a very, very long history uh, in that region, uh, Maragami region. Uh, samurai had a sort of interesting or even peculiar lifestyle. Um, in the case of Edo, this is a, a drawing of a typical samurai district in Edo. Um, it, they had houses, uh, they had gardens, uh, they were given property, basically hereditarily handed down for them to use. Uh, it looks a little bit like a typical housing development today in many ways, if you would see it from that point of view. Um, there was quite a few ranks of samurai often living in uh, similar neighborhoods side by side uh, and families living with the same neighbors for, for years, for hundreds of years. In fact, I know in Fukushima, uh, in, in the town of uh, um, uh, like Futaba, there was an old samurai district uh, where the people that I know who grew up there uh, have been neighbors for 400 years with the people across the street, which to me is remarkable. Um, samurai, unlike the, the townspeople, uh, they had gardens. Their property was usually surrounded by a wall. There was a gate. Only samurai were allowed to have gates, and the size and the you know, elaborateness of the gate indicated the status of the family. Uh, so, of course, that could change uh, under some circumstances, but basically you would walk down the street and there would be these walls, uh, and sometimes, in this case, I drew them as wood, but of course they could be earthen walls, um, they could, the roofs on these could be tile, they could be wood shingles, they could be many things, uh, and the gardens are behind. Uh, so it's sort of a mysterious thing, and then uh, peering in the gate, uh, basically this procession, this access from the front gate to the front door uh, was very, very important, and then they also had, you know, more than one entry, which we'll talk about, but this is sort of the formal entry uh, of a typical samurai house, sort of a lower ranking, middle lower ranking samurai. Of course, there were samurai of many, many ranks, and uh, higher rank samurai really were able to build in a very sophisticated style known as Shoin style. Uh, this is a drawing by some very good architectural illustrators, uh, Inaba and Nakayama. Uh, and the Shoin style has a history from about the 15th century, really begun by um, Monks, particularly Zen monks, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, putting uh, tatami mats on the floor, using the tokonoma, uh, this decorative alcove, and many features that we consider to be typical Japanese architectural features today. Uh, and of course, initially it was a very elite thing. Uh, this is Katsura Rikyu from basically mid 17th century, uh, which is a fab fabulous uh, imperial retreat uh, outside of Kyoto. This is a prime example of Shoin style architecture. Uh, and uh, key to the show in style is, of course, the integration of the house, the living quarters, and the garden. This is Kachiriku's garden. One view, it's a beautiful garden. If you have a chance to go visit there, I really encourage you to. Um, particularly from inside the old show in uh, is a famous view. Uh, the sliding screens, the, the shoji open, the shutters outside are open, uh, and you can see this uh, garden surrounding you. Uh, and uh, this, basically the garden is intended to be viewed, in this case, from inside the room. So this integration of this architectural space, this wide opening, basically no 
walls, really. The whole thing is like this big uh, window opening uh, that allows the exterior in. This is sort of key to the show and style. And um, uh, also inside a very flexible space that can be divided and subdivided by using uh, the sliding Fusuma screens, for instance. Uh, these were characteristics that, again, uh, upper ranking samurai could have very, 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 very beautiful examples. But basically, every samurai house had these features replicated in some way. Um, this is the zashiki of, uh, of a uh, middle, lower ranking samurai who was living in Edo. Uh, and again, it has the features, the tokonoma, the niche, where there would be a hanging scroll. Maybe in this case, it's calligraphy. It could be a painting. Uh, here is the sword stand. Samurai often uh, displayed their weapons there, but it could be something else. Um, this uh, is called a tobukuro. Uh, in this case, uh, often there's a, a, a decorative shelf, which I'll show you from the yokoi house. This one doesn't have that but there's a uh, room for ornamentation and the room, the floor is covered with tatami mats, which can be used very, very flexibly. Uh, and, uh, you know, seen from the plan, this is one of the few examples of from a Edo period samurai house where we actually have a kind of diagrammatic floor plan, which I use to, to draw these pictures. Um, the key is that uh, they have uh, a, a set piece of property. This is the gate, this is the main house, and they have a garden. And half of the property is basically devoted to the garden. Uh, and this garden has a pond, and it has a bridge, and it has lots of trees. Like the farmers I showed earlier, the trees are carefully selected for you know climate control, wind control, to provide food, nuts and fruit, etc. cetera. Um, but over time, the samurai were, because they were on a fixed income, they became poorer and poorer, and ultimately needed to to uh, uh, devote a part of their gardens to vegetable plots. <clears throat> and uh, I think, you know, in the case of the Yokoi house, we had some discussion about this. They were growing food. It was necessary. They weren't allowed, samurai were not allowed to sell the food, but they could distribute it through this sort of gift exchange called susowake. So if I have too many apples, I can give it to my neighbor or my relative, and they'll give me their eggplants and sort of goes around in that sort of gift uh, economy. Um, so... Um, and again, you know, there were some small outbuildings like a latrine and maybe a shed for the garden, et cetera. Uh, if we look at the floor plan of this, uh, this is the main entrance here, and I'll zoom in in a moment. Uh, there's a main entrance, uh, the house is there. Uh, there's a garden on this side, the main garden. There's the kitchen garden here, a well, a uh, latrine, uh, and, uh, you know, here's the main house. And to sort of zoom in on that, um, <clears throat> The entries are very interesting because they relate to social status and sort of indicate social structure and interpersonal relationships. So this is the formal entry. It's a genkan. Uh, in the case of the Yokoi house, I think they call it the okyaku kyaku genkan. Uh, which means the guest entry. Uh, it's basically intended for people of a higher status than you to, re to uh, you know, receive people who you really uh, need to show uh, respect and deference towards. Uh, most of the family use this side entrance, this one next to it, uh, called the tomariguchi in this case. Uh, and there's a lot of different terminology depending on where you are. Uh, and also a third entry like the back door, the kitchen door, uh, which would be used by s servants and family and kids, etc. There is a fairly large wood floored area, in this case in the kitchen, uh, but no real dirt floor area. Uh, then there are the tatami matted rooms, the zashiki, the reception room, which has the tokonoma and the, the, the shelves, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the veranda, the engawa, which leads to a toilet sort of outside. And this is the toilet intended for like guests. Uh, most people, the family would use the toilet that's in the garden back there. Next to this is a room that's called the ima, which means study. It's it, basically the master of the house's sort of private room. Uh, he could use this room for receiving important guests and or groups of people, but if he needed to talk privately, he would do it here, or maybe this is where he is doing his reading and writing. Uh, and next to that is a room, in this case, called a nema, a sleeping room, uh, which in the daytime when they're not sleeping, I mean, the futons could be rolled and put out of the way. Uh, it could be used by, for instance, the women of the family, the children of the family. So uh, it's a very, very flexible space. And of course, the key was this view of the garden from the zashiki, that this was important as an ornamental garden. But as I mentioned, over time, they needed to start growing their own food. And it ultimately became, you, think, you have to think of uh, the city of Edo with you know 1.3 million people of whom <clears throat> almost half are samurai uh, growing their own food. This urban farming was a massive scale uh, in Edo. And there was no shame to growing food because you remember samurai initially were farmers. And of course they were very literate so they would approach it kind of intellectually reading farm manuals, how to grow the best eggplant, how to grow the best pumpkins, uh, maybe even competing with each other for that sort of thing. Um, so the uh, notable 
whole aspect of these houses, again, samurai houses, it's definitely the case, and any sort of what we consider Japanese style house, particularly in the Showin style, and this is sort of derived from the Showin style, not as grand as Katsura Rikyu or, or of a high-ranking samurai, was the flexibility. So for a formal occasion, the zashiki and the room next to it, the tsugi, uh, no ma, they could be connected. Uh, but the private zone, the family room, the study, and the, the sleeping room and the kitchen, those might be closed off. There's no need for the guests to uh, go there or to be aware of that. Of course, if there's something going on and, and the master says, ah, we should talk in my room privately, they could certainly go there and do that. Uh, for daily use, um, you know, again, we're, the, the private spaces, the family spaces, were more likely to be connected and make it easy to go back and forth. And like a lot of people's living rooms uh, here in the U.S., you know, you close off the, the good room and really don't use that unless there's a real occasion for that. Uh, and then there might be even more informal occasions where let's say it's a lot of family, uh, women, uh, relatives who are welcome in the kitchen to go in and out, lots of kids, where they might connect these sorts of rooms together. So this flexibility is key, and we'll sort of look at that as well in the Yokoi house in a moment. Um, Everything about Japanese architecture in ter terms of wall panels and the construction, um, well, one goal was to make it as open as possible, to make it naturally cooled, to keep it uh, the breezes coming through, and also to allow in as much light as possible. And there was lots of ways to modulate light. I mean, uh, outside were sort of uh, wooden shutters for against rain and against uh, inclement weather, and also often closed at night for protection. And then usually uh, shoji screens, the translucent screens, usually right in this exterior wall area. Um, outside of the veranda, they would often uh, have, like, a, in the summertime, a trellis of climbing vines like morning glories or, or, or even uh, vegetables. Uh, the fusuma are opaque. They're more likely to be used uh, between rooms that need to be separated. Uh, if we zoom in, though, one of the wonderful things about Japanese architecture is the quality of light uh, that comes in indirectly and reflects off the floor, and you get this very diffuse quality of light, by and large, uh, that can still be modulated and controlled depending on which panel and what kind it is. Uh, it, so this is something that's been written by, uh, written on this sort of, often the interior is a bit dark uh, and intentionally so. Uh, so uh, Junichiro Tanazaki wrote the beautiful In Praise of Shadows that really talks about this at some degree. Um, Another aspect is that on these tatami mat floors, it's not like a Western building or home where the furniture's there and it's in place. You can sit anywhere, uh, and it means you can move around to take advantage of the light and the warmth. I'm showing here on the left the summer condition, winter condition. Let's say in the morning, the sunlight is coming here uh, and illuminating this, so that may be where you want to sit. You put down your little zabuton cushion and drink your tea sitting there. Uh, in the winter, the light angle is a bit lower. It may go in deeper, not as sharp as I'm showing here. It's going to be a bit diffused but um, you know, basically you can move. Uh, noon, of course, the light uh, sun is more high overhead. Uh, maybe there's not going to be a good place to sit in the summer. You want to sit in the shade instead. Uh, in the winter, of course, you probably want to sit in the sunlight. Uh, in the, su in the uh, afternoon, of course, you, it's the opposite of the, the morning. You will find a good place to sit on the other side of the room from where you were earlier. Uh, and it's not like there was a rule about this, but this accommodated this kind of moving around to take advantage of the, the sunlight and the other aspects of the natural environment and the breeze and these panels, these fusuma, these shoji um, allowed uh, incredible control of breezes, of airflow, etc. Often using gardens uh, as a means of cooling the air uh, before it came into the house. Uh, these examples are actually machia from Edo and from Kyoto. Kyoto particularly has something called a tsuboniwa in the middle, a small tiny little garden that has a water feature. It's cooler. It's sort of a microclimate that, um, you know, uh, definitely uh, it's, it's, it's several degrees cooler than the outside. Um, the materials themselves also had an important sort of response. Again, the materials are primarily wood for the structure. Tatami mats on the floor, these are made of a, of a grass, layers of grass and straw woven together. The walls are made of earth. Uh, and all of these basically uh, absorbed you know, moisture when it was very, very humid and could release it when it was dry. Uh, so this is sort of a responsive environment uh, that made it more comfortable uh, to live in. Uh, and thinking about these issues of circularity and material use, um, you know, again, this aspect uh, of Japanese architecture being able to be dismantled. Uh, when I went, I was fascinated by these joints, these wooden joints. Uh, it's called kigumi in Japanese, uh, held together with pegs and wedges. It can be totally dismantled. It's also largely modular. Uh, so when a building was dismantled, it really took advantage of that aspect. Um, 
for instance, the large beams and columns, um, there were lumber yards in the big cities that specialized in only selling used timber like these. And because it is modular, you could go to that lumber yard and find a beam or a column that with minor modification would probably fit the thing you're trying to build. Uh, roof tiles last a very long time. Uh, if you demolished a building, uh, you could salvage the tiles and some would come by them. Uh, things like floorboards, they were usually very, very thick. You could plane the surface clean and reuse them. Uh, things like uh, uh, wooden cedar shingles, which are also used for roofing. They were very, very dry. They could be, people use them for kindling. Anything made of metal was very valuable. The country was kind of uh, scarce on metal and that could be uh, melted down and reused in many, many ways. Uh, of course, because of this modularity, and again, the circularity principles talk about modular design. And this is a wonderful example. All these doors, it's called tategu, uh, you know, the, the fusuma, the doors, the shutters, uh, and also the tatami. You could take them from one house and if it's in the same town, take it to another house and it's probably going to fit perfectly. Uh, they're totally, totally uh, upcyclable, all of these things. Uh, the, dirt, the, the earthen wall, you could crumble that, um, put it in the garden, and they would usually mix uh, old clay into the new clay uh, when they're making a new uh, clay wall, so that was also being reused. And all of this, I would say, is very, very circular, uh, really kind of an ideal thing. There's a movement now uh, called Buildings as Material Banks, which actually thinks the same way, that a building should not be considered the end use of the materials, but simply a place that's holding it uh, until uh, the next use. In other words, it's, a, it's storing the materials uh, in a way that makes them available, and there's a lot of engineering and material development going on to make this sort of thing more and more possible, but the Japanese method shows the way. Um, there was also a very interesting thing that was happening um, uh, both in, you know, basically all throughout in the cities and the farms that uh, human waste was considered very valuable as fertilizer. So toilets were designed, of course, to be cleaned out. Uh, they would separate the solid and the liquid, uh, they would compost this generally for a year. Uh, it would be a hot compost generating heat, uh, killing a lot of the you know, microorganisms, the parasites, etc. And uh, that allowed a much greater agricultural productivity. And the kind of interesting thing was at the beginning, um, if you were a landowner, you had a latrine on your property, uh, you would have to pay someone to come clean it out. But as the farmers recognized the value and wanted more and more of this, they ended up paying for it. And there were markets, there were brokers, there was transportation systems, standardized containers, uh, and again, this was a nationwide phenomenon. And particularly uh, in, in farming regions surrounding cities, it was a fantastic resource for agriculture. There was so much of this being generated in the cities, uh, and also these price ranking depending on, you know, the, the quality of it, uh, and it seems that the uh, Yoshiwara, the entertainment quarters, had the highest price because they were feasting every night, etc. Uh, so this went on for a very, very long time, uh, and we were discussing this yesterday. Um, one of the main reasons why this can't really be done now for food is because uh, we have so much pharmaceuticals uh, in our bodies, and uh, that is a big danger. Um, so now let's look at the Yokoi house. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it was from a place called uh, Marugame uh, in Shikoku. This is as it was reconstructed here, and I really uh, am impressed with this reconstruction for a lot of reasons, uh, not the least of which is this vision of trying to include the agriculture, include the rice paddies, include the vegetable fields, uh, and think about the water supply, thinking about all this stuff to represent this as an integrated whole, not just a building, but something that is uh, kind of continuing to interact with its environment. Um, in the front is what's called a Nagaya Mon, and I'm, I showed you the Nagaya apartment. It's kind of similar. Of course, Nagaya means long house. Uh, Nagaya Mon, a Nagaya gate, long gate, uh, is a, a sign of high status. And uh, they were often uh, more higher ranking samurai could have them. Uh, in this case, the shoya could have them uh, for many reasons. Inside was often storage, maybe a stable, and also room for uh, helpers, retainers, etc., to live. Uh, and then there's a, a yard, I'll show you more uh, plans of this, a front yard, which is basically a work yard called a niwa, and then the, the uh, most formal garden, uh, which is going to open onto this side of the house where the zashiki is, and then we have several entrances, the formal entry, and the sort of daily use family entry. Uh, the main house is called an Omoya. Uh, there are other buildings as well, currently not yet reconstructed, but I heard uh, from Robert today that they would like to uh, reconstruct them. And uh, Marugame, where was Marugame, you know? This is, uh, it's kind of off the beaten track. Um, 
there were about 250 daimyo, uh, uh, you know, Han daimyo uh, domains in the Japan during the Edo, Edo period, and these are all sort of color-coded. Uh, a wonderful researcher named Fabian Drixler, who's done an incredible job of mapping these things out. And uh, Marugame is uh, here in Shikoku Island. Uh, here is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, here is uh, 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 Takamatsu, over here, and Marugame is a fairly small domain there uh, in, in Shikoku, and they, that's where they lived, and they had a very, very long history there. Um, over here, this is uh, Osaka and Kyoto. I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry. Um, when you approach the house, the first thing you see, of course, is this Nagaya Mon. This has been reconstructed from new material because the original was no longer extant. Uh, and there's some interpretation done, but I think it's very, very accurate. It's used for different purposes now. Uh, this is a photo, a more historical photo, of the house in its original situation uh, in Imaza village in Marogame. Uh, so again, this is the front yard, the, the uh, Niwa. Here's the wall for the garden behind it. This would be the main entrance, the side entrance, and this beautiful uh, palm there, which uh, again, it's a bit intriguing, you know, how and why uh, that became this uh, wonderful plant there. And the, in the reconstruction, it basically uh, has preserved all of those aspects. Um, the plan, um, it's interesting. It's very intriguing. And as we're going through it, I'm going through it with Robert and others, um, you know, a lot of discussion of, yeah, this is a very interesting house. How did they really live there? Um, you know, uh, I guess um, I have a, these plans here. You know, rooms have names. There's the zashiki. There's what was called, they were calling the oku zashiki, the inner reception room, which is really more like the ima that I showed you before, the sort of study. Uh, there's a room uh, also, there was a room that was an ima. Uh, there was um, a, a something called the chanam. I wrote tea room. And that's actually it was where they would eat. Uh, there was the kitchen here, which is wooden floored. Uh, there was a maid's room uh, and a connecting room. Uh, there was a middle room. Basically, the entrance leads to here. The guests would wait there and be brought into the zashiki. Uh, There's another room called the minami no ma, which apparently was used as an office because their job as shoya was to you know, uh, keep tax records, financial records, other records for, this, for the village. Uh, they would do that. There was also storage on the earth floored uh, area as well. And of course, it evolved over time. Uh, uh, also has these sort of fascinating second story, hidden second story rooms. Uh, one is a kakurebeya, called a kakurebeya and others. Uh, so to show you the house, this is uh, derived from the illustrations that uh, were produced here at the hunting and I sort of uh, edited them. Um, so this is the house. Um, again, this is the zashiki here. Uh, this is the, the dirt floored area. This is the kitchen. Uh, this is the oku zashiki, which may be an ima. This is what's called an ima, but might have been a nema. It's hard to know exactly what it was. Uh, so the one first thing is the, the doma zone. Many people, uh, that's the first thing they experience. Most people, unless they were a higher rank, uh, they would basically be on the dirt floored area in their shoes. And this was used for daily work, um, making things, and again, the kitchen in the back uh, was actually part, the domo is a big part of the kitchen as well. Uh, this other area here, um, I'm calling it the formal or the public zone. Uh, again, this is where meetings would be held, where important guests would be received. Uh, and as I showed earlier, it could be configured based by, you know, based on moving the, the fusuma, the sliding screens to, to, to make it the right size for whatever event it was. Uh, and again, this is a public and um, it has a finer finish, slightly better materials piers and uh, better decorative materials. Of course, the tokonoma, the decorative niche and the, t the, the shelf, the chigaidana, those are very, very fine. Um, beyond that, of course, is the private zone, as I mentioned. This would be sort of more the family uh, and, and good friends, intimates who might go there. Um, and uh, something very, very interesting is in the center of the house is what's called a butsuma, which means Buddha room. Uh, it is a room where there's a family altar which honors the dead ancestors and would be a place where religious ceremonies are held, incense burned, uh, the monks would come to pray. And uh, it is very interesting that uh, this occupies a very prominent place right in the center and the other rooms are sort of around it. So I think it really is the spiritual center of the house. Um, 
it actually is on the pathway to go from here to there, uh, so you would always be passing by the Butsama. Often they're really totally closed off, so this is a very intriguing uh, design aspect. I, I guess if we talk about spiritual centers, there's many things that can be a spiritual center. I also think the garden is a sort of spiritual center, and this is a view of the garden from the Zashki. Um, you know, it's interesting. It has, you know, a pond, it has a bridge, it has a miniature mountain, it has stones that are representing turtles, uh, uh, comets, and, uh, and in the house are nail head cover designs. I think I have a photo um, which represents Sudu cranes, and this Sudu Kame combination is very, very auspicious. Uh, so again, like Katsura Rikyu, you know, the idea is that, you know, the rooms can be opened on two sides in the corner and you're surrounded by the garden. Of course, this is not as vast uh, and as luxurious as the garden at Katsura, but it still is functioning in the same way. And the design is really sophisticated in creating an illusion of greater depth. Uh, it's kind of remarkable. It's intended to be seen from a seated position as well. Uh, so uh, in, in, there's lots to say about Japanese gardens. Uh, yeah, again, here is the, the pond, which is like a miniature lake. And here's a bridge. And here's the mountain. Mountain, and here's some uh, outstanding rocks, which are mountain peaks, and you have trees of many, many sorts. Um, interestingly, very nearby and roughly contemporaneous with this particular house is something called the Ritsurin Garden in Takamatsu, which was built by the daimyo, much wealthier daimyo of that particular province in the, in the mid 18th century. And again, you see, you have the lake, you have the bridge, uh, you have uh, artificial mountains, and this wonderful uh, natural mountain, which is used as a what's called borrowed scenery or shake to sort of in, in, increase the impact of, of the garden itself to sort of uh, frame it, etc. So um, I think perhaps everyone in the region knew about this garden, even if they couldn't see it. And I think uh, it would always be on their mind. Uh, again, of another view of the house from the garden. Um, it's almost like a little hut when you see it from here. And there is a lot of poetry and art that shows the scholar's hut in the wilderness. And I think it was trying to evoke this sort of attitude to remain connected with nature, uh, even though you're now a bureaucrat and, a, and an administrator. Uh, in the rear view, again, this has been beautifully restored. The rear garden, I'm not clear on how it was actually used, but I think it was mainly a workyard, but some private uh, uh, ornamental garden uh, near this corner of the house where the private rooms are. Uh, the zashiki is very, very fine. It's it's a really superb ex example. Uh, interesting uh, wall treatment of this gray and uh, kind of bizarre. And in the photograph, it, you, you see it appears to be three shades of gray. And, and Robert indicated, in fact, this gray wall and this is the same color. It's one of those strange illusions, but it's kind of remarkable. Very, very fine woodwork cabinetry here. A very, very nice toko bashira, the ornamental post that's framing the tokonoma. Uh, Showin, by the way, uh, really comes from uh, the uh, a writing desk, uh, and this is called a, a tsuke showing. Uh, so this is basically originally was considered a desk, and there were examples where it really was a usable desk. So this is actually the show, and so if you were a monk, you were literate, and you were uh, taking care of that kind of business. Um, again, this is this enfilade seen from the doma, from the dirtful area, all the way through to the zashiki over there. So again, it's it's a linear thing, and this is kind of strange that you have these three lines uh, with the sort of inner inner space and the outer space. Uh, in the house, and this is a more historical photo uh, of it. Um, I noted that these paintings, uh, I guess they didn't, didn't survive or they didn't make it. Uh, interesting use of color as well. Uh, another view of the Zashiki. It has a beautiful, well, very, again, intriguing uh, Ramma, which is a transom, a carved transom decoration. Uh, and uh, this is a sort of, a, uh, you know, uh, more formalizes, sort of dresses up the room, uh, also allows air to, to proceed. Uh, this is a nail head cover. It's not a tsuru, but it's a, uh, I guess, a moth. Uh, not a butterfly, probably a moth. Um, again, the house has uh, a half characteristics of a farmhouse, some of a farmhouse, like these sort of roughly hewn beams overhead, these raw logs used uh, to form the roof structure. Uh, the doma here, uh, this is very, very clean, spick and span compared to how it would be if it was actually being used. Uh, but this is the earthen floored area when you come in from the side entrance uh, and the work area and the kitchen beyond. Uh, and you would step up into the house uh, if you need to do that. Um, so so it has uh, some aspects of a farmhouse as well as of a samurai house. And to sort of compare it to other samurai and shoya houses, um, again, there are um, quite a few extant, I would say. Uh, the more you look, the more you find. Uh, this is one in Himeji uh, called the Miki House. Uh, and this is the Nagayamon. It's really grand. 
Uh, this indicates very, very high status. The house itself, though, is almost entirely a minka, a farmhouse. Uh, and both in its exterior aspect with the thatched roof, uh, it still has the several entrances, the more formal one uh, and a daily use one, even big enough to bring animals in and out, and probably another one to the side. And over here is the wall, and the, the formal garden would be behind that. Uh, but if you look on the inside, oops, sorry, um, it has a, a very, very large uh, doma and these incredibly incredibly massive beams uh, uh, and the big kitchen. And this is a very large wood floored area, Itama. So this is really a farmhouse. Uh, so that to me is very, very interesting. Whereas we look at the, uh, uh, the Okoi house, it's really a samurai house. And uh, an example of a similarly sized samurai house is the Shiomi house in Matsue, which is also from the Edo period. And this is the Nagayamon in the front. And of course, they would use, uh, have animals in there and also rooms for uh, their assistants, their, their, their you know, staff, basically. Uh, if you go to the, uh, go in and see the entrances, you know, this is sort of the aspect of the house. It's similarly one story. Um, it's uh, you know got basically a few additions onto it and these separate separate entrances etc. Um, you know one the, the the formal entrance and then the the informal entrance and then the garden behind the wall and the zashiki is over here and again it's a very very fine zashiki and in this case you can tell there's a different uh, craftsmanship and a dis different attention to materials and details in the formal side the public side as opposed to the private side uh, and its kitchen uh, has like no doma. I mean, almost, I mean, there is Doma somewhere, but it's much more cluttered and much more narrow. Um, so um, something that I think I may have forgotten to mention is that the uh, uh, Yokoi house has this strange hidden second story, uh, which I've never seen before. And looking up into it, it's very spacious. Uh, I've seen similar things in places like Kanazawa that were done to hide living space, second stories for tax purposes. This wasn't what that was. Uh, you could climb up uh, and hide and look out through the gable to the castle. And uh, the, what we were informed was that this was in case there was a revolt or something happening uh, because these are uh, village officials, often revolts were aimed at them uh, and uh, because it relates to justice and money and fairness. Uh, so this would allow them to hide uh, and protect themselves until the revolt passed over. Uh, so I'm just gonna end with just a couple of questions. You know, uh, what are we preserving? when we are preserving something like this. It's one thing to keep the material, to keep the stuff, but we really are, I think we really should think about those invisibles that I talked about at the very beginning. What is the sensibility? What is our inner experience? Today, as several of us were in the house, um, we all remarked at how quiet it was. Um, I found it a bit transporting, um, you know, partly because it's alien, partly just because it's beautiful, natural, has a wonderful aroma, the quality of sound is different. It allows us, I think, to feel some kind of tranquility, which is very, very important. When we think about you know, building the farms, building the fields, uh, reproducing that sort of thing, preserving that, what is that that we're doing? Uh, it's not simply the function of feeding ourselves or doing some educational project. It is, again, calling attention and, and restoring this interconnected balance that we know existed in Japan at this time as well as many other places. Almost every indigenous culture had similar characteristics, I think, uh, and yet we have grown so distant from that. So I think uh, this is an example, an opportunity for us to uh, think about those interconnections and how we will try to um, make use of that, to use that, to promote that in our own lives. Uh, and finally, for me, the question is always, who is it for? Who is it for? I love that the Huntington is public. I love that it's so accessible. Uh, so many people come here. Uh, they can see this. They can they can live this way. The Yokoi House was kind of elite, uh, you know. But average houses had a lot of the same characteristics. The farmers, uh, the merchants, even the people living in those one room nagaya, they had a lot of the same characteristics. And we should think about how this works for everybody. Uh, so this is the end, and we have some time I think left for uh, for questions. Uh, the book from which most of these drawings were taken was just enough. Uh, and I know some people have read it, uh, and I heard that it was an inspiration for this project, which is really, really gratifying. And there's copies outside I'm happy to sign for you. So that's the end. I hope I didn't go over. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, 
During the Edo period, when this transformation took place, because as you pointed out, there was a couple of hundred years of revolts and the forest got destroyed and so on. How did it actually come about? Did it evolve? Was there an edict that came down through the shogun and the bureaucrats? It just seems like such a radical change over That's a that period. Great question, because one thing that I think you know, researchers agree is that government generally exerted a very light hand. Uh, there were cases like edicts about protecting the forest. There were sumptuary laws which were um, designed to uh, minimize you know, overuse of resources, etc. But basically, uh, people were motivated by uh, their own maximizing their own advantage, saving money, uh, having a better lifestyle, uh, their own frugality, you know, their own personal interest. Uh, and it, it was an emergent. Uh, phenomenon in an emergent system. No one sat up there and said, we're going to design, you know, an agricultural system that purifies water. They didn't do that. You know, it emerged and people see, oh, this is a result of this. We will try to, you know, maintain this result. And I think this to me is some, one of the big lessons that I would like us to take. You know, what is the role of government guidance in this sort of thing? Uh, there is a role, uh, but I think uh, when people see that it is uh, advantageous to themselves, then they're more likely to adopt these activities or these ways of living. Thank you so much. This was really a wonderful presentation. And at the very beginning, when you were showing about joinery and the pictures, I am just wondering what what is the connection between the joinery that you described initially and the craftsman movement, where they show tongue and groove? Um, mm -hmm. And you know, here in Pasadena, there's so many homes that were built in the craftsman area. Is there a connection Bet about the actual woodcraft, the joinery? Yes. Uh, yes. You know, this was simply the best technology they had. Uh, and if we look at Europe, contemporaneous Europe, or later, you know, North America, uh, wooden buildings were built in a very, very similar way. Uh, the Japanese uh, basically received that technology from mainland Asia, East Asia, from China and the Korean Peninsula back in like the seventh century. So uh, it's very common in other parts. Some aspects are very common in Asia as well. Uh, but I think what the Japanese did that I don't think we saw or if we did, not to the same degree, was this modularization of the design, basing it on this tatami mat size. Uh, and again, there was regional variation and change over time, uh, but that allowed a lot of design uh, you know, developments, a lot of innovation to happen in terms of reuse, in terms of flexibility. So to me, that's the main connection. And then the fact that it could be removed. In I showed you the uh, temple in Nara, uh, Yakushiji. That was a capital city with, you know, tens of thousands of people back in the seventh century. And then a hundred years later, the capital moved and they literally dismantled most of the buildings and moved them from there to, to uh, Heian, which was Kyoto, uh, and left a lot of the temple. So they, they were, you could move the buildings. You could put them where you wanted them. And once you moved the building or demolished it, there was nothing there. You could, you could make a garden the next day. So I think people understood the benefits of this and then preserved them and, and developed it and, and refined it over the course of centuries. Someone else? Anything. <laughs> I hope it was clear. I crammed a lot into it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so how many of you have visited Japan? My goodness. That's great. That's like three quarters of you, two thirds. Um, yeah. So I imagine many of you have visited temples. Have, how many have been to Katsura Rikyu? I've never been in a talk where as many people have been to Katsura Rikyu before. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you understand that. It's unfortunate, Katsuriki is a bit difficult to visit and they sort of herd you through. You can't really spend time to savor it, but it is really a, 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 a guide stone, a, a, you know, a key um, 
you know, event in architecture and garden design in Japan that has influenced so many things. And to me, again, the fact that the show and style was, you know, elevated and higher status. And even if you're a samurai with not a lot of money, you're going to have your zashiki and your garden, even if it's tiny, right? Uh, so to me, that's very, very interesting you're, to try to preserve at least symbolically uh, and, and psychologically and emotionally that connection between your, your, your modest, austere, uh, you know, living quarters and, and the nature outside. So uh, again, for the samurai, I didn't really stress it too much, but their life was fairly austere. Um, you know, they were disciplined, they were militarily trained, uh, they were warriors, they had very strict codes and, and laws were stricter for them than they were for commoners, for, for, for farmers and others. And among those laws were this kind of sumptuary codes I mentioned. So, you know, uh, you couldn't build a bigger gate than the law allowed, or you would get in big trouble. Uh, you couldn't build a tea house unless you were of an appropriate status to do that. Merchants couldn't have gates, like I mentioned. They also couldn't have tea houses. But as they got wealthier and had bigger and bigger houses, some of them, they found ways to hide tea rooms uh, within their houses in a similar way to the sort of hidden second story that we see at the Yokoi house. Uh, and the same thing with finishes like lacquer was only allowed for the highest status, uh, you know, uh, daimyo and, and ranks right below that. Uh, but you know, some, some merchants had enough money, they would have their secret lacquered tea rooms and things. So it's always this sense of aspiration. People always want to aspire to the higher uh, status level. And uh, one interesting phenomenon that happened after the Meiji period was suddenly there was no more law against having gates, for instance. So everybody built a gate. Not everybody, but almost everybody. They wanted the gate. Uh, and in Kanazawa, uh, samurai houses had a very interesting gable with a sort of uh, grid of beams, these big horizontal beams, like, and the, the higher status, you'd have more beams. It was kind of a wasteful use of material. And sure enough, in the Meiji period, things opened up, the laws changed, and suddenly every commoner who could would build in the same way to have that status signifier. So these aspirations are very, very interesting. And yet, what about those internal aspirations? You know, what about these, this contemplative life? What about this life of, of discipline and uh, frugality and, uh, you know, thinking of the Zen principles uh, of, of, you know, detachment and not having uh, more than you need? So I think the internal principles got lost uh, in favor of, you know, materialism and, and consumerism and uh, market economy, which, again, today we see a lot of us look at Japan as a potential source of uh, new modes of living, of solutions for uh, sort of social ills and, and the mental ills that we have living in our society, thinking Japan has some secrets to teach us. I, I think perhaps it does, but you go to Japan, and of course, it's wild, you know, noisy. You go to Shibuya, go to Hachiko Crossing, you wonder, are these people really, you know, contemplative? and uh, etc. But of course you, you find it. I mean you find it in surprising places. This kind of thoughtfulness, mindfulness, uh, attention to detail, uh, care for nature and often very, very beautiful and subtle ways. Yes? Um, one question from me but also there's one comment from someone who's watching the live stream in response to a previous question. And they, it's hard to hear from up there, isn't it? I'm having a hard time hearing. Yes, I. Um, the person online commented in response to the qu question about the relationship between Japanese architecture and the craftsman movement locally, that the Green and Breen brothers were strongly influenced by the whole, the whole den, um, the Phoenix Hall building that was reconstructed as part of the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Um, so in some sense, their local version of the craftsman style does have a sort of direct connection to Japan, albeit mediated through that world's exposition. And I'm sure Ken will have something to comment about it. I think actually that Adelaide Tishner hired them. Uh, them yeah, uh, please wait, yeah, the microphone. And send them at least one of the, sorry. One of the brothers, I should say, Robert and I have agreed on that. 
so, Frank Lloyd Wright was right, right, right. Frank Lloyd Wright went to the whole. Well, he was in Chicago in the whole den in the Prairie House. But certainly, yes. Uh, whether it's Wright in 1904. The um, Green Brothers, uh, uh, right in 1894, the Green Brothers in 1904, through World's Fairs, Japanese architecture is being built because of its modularity and, you know, transportability. And of course, um, like the um, uh, older display house, not true living house at the Huntington, which was a, a Japanese display house brought in 1903 to Pasadena by George Turner Marsh. And so there were, Japanese architecture was seen in America and, you know, having this major impact, as you point out, on arts and crafts. Yeah, I, I might add something to this. Um, it's fascinating to me to see this cross fertilization. These, you know, of course, the Meiji period. There's an incredible importation of Western uh, thinking, design, technology, you know, governing principles, etc. And then the opposite happening as well, especially with the creative arts, decorative arts. Uh, that was really fascinating. Uh, at the time when I was uh, studying at Yale, uh, there were no classes, for instance, in Japanese architecture. Uh, I made, I was fortunate to be able to make a tutorial with a professor to make our own syllabus, uh, you know, reading, etc. And uh, that was the bulk of my senior year was, was devoted to that. That is kind of inconceivable now. A any uh, university, particularly with an architecture department, will have courses on Japanese architecture now. Also at the time, I'm you know, from New Orleans, I went to a party uh, for architects and architecture students from Tulane University. And, um, you know, they... One, someone asked me, oh, I hear you're studying architecture. Yeah, what are you studying? Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier. And I said, well, yes, I'm studying that, but I'm very interested in Japanese architecture. At the time, I was like contemporary architecture, uh, Tadao Ando and Kikutake, metabolism, and also, you know, Minka. And the guy didn't reply, just turned around and walked away. As if, yeah, as if I was speaking gibberish, as if the poor guy, he's babbling, and we don't know what he's talking about. That was back in like 1980, 1978 or 80. Again, the difference now is incredible in the intervening uh, decades. Uh, and I, right before coming to LA, I was in uh, Colorado at the Timber Framers Guild uh, annual convention, which was fabulous. Uh, these are people, again, this started back in the late 70s, and they're extremely interested in Japanese carpentry and architecture. And there was one person, a French Canadian there, who was speaking and giving demonstrations. He builds in the Japanese style, very high level of skill. And he learned from an American in America. And that American had learned, gone to Japan and learned. So it's possible this stuff is being handed down now. It's, it's out in the world. Uh, this next generation of, of craftsmen are being trained. And you don't even have to go to Japan to do it anymore. To me, that was also very eye-opening. Uh, so much has changed in that. So this interchange will continue, of course. Uh, and the last thing about this is, uh, you know, compared to that uh, Tulane architecture student or whoever he was, might have been a professor, um, I, uh, two or three years ago I was reading a magazine, Architecture Magazine, you know, 40 architects under 40, and every single one had either studied in Japan or worked with a Japanese architect or done an internship or spent time in Japan. It's like the Grand Tour. It's like studying in Rome was for the Beaux-Arts architects. Uh, now you have to go to Japan. You have to be familiar with this stuff in order to be considered an educated architect. And that, to me, is, again, a remarkable uh, kind of a wonderful thing. Yeah. So I, I wanted to go back to the question about or the issue of sumptuary regulation. Um, and specifically with the Shoya houses, you know, you said there were like 70,000 villages in, J in Edo period Japan. So every one of those 70,000 villages presumably had a shoya. Um, was every one of those shoya houses identical in layout? Um, were they all governed, were, were they all, you know, essentially the same? And what, hmm. what room was there for kind of modulation either regionally yeah. or personally? Um, maybe we should let R Robert answer this, but one observation is certain key features uh, are shared. Again, the uh, entranceways, um, you know, based on status, the zashiki itself, uh, a division between the public, formal, and the private family spaces. Uh, beyond that, there seems to be a lot of variation. As we look at the Yokoi house, you know, sort of puzzling, you know, why did they do that? And we can talk to 
the family members uh, who remembered living there, when the family was living there and how it was used. But of course, things change over time. And we can look at the structure and the building itself and say, well, maybe this was added later. Uh, is this original? Was this modified? And sometimes it's, it's easier to tell and sometimes it's very, very difficult to tell. Uh, there was, I, I guess, to try to answer it simply, is there was a lot of variation within uh, uh, certain specific guidelines of what was appropriate and necessary. And it had to do with social relations and in some ways political relations. Like we were hearing uh, about um, uh, there were some people, I mean, most people would be allowed into the Doma area and you'd stand down there and, and state your business and maybe have your interchange or whatever with someone who's up on the floor, on the on the, the tatami floor. Uh, but some people wouldn't even, it was not uh, considered appropriate for them for even to go that far, that there was sort of a, a lattice uh, uh, door or window and they would have to be outside that speaking in. So there's an incredible consciousness of status uh, and of uh, propriety in this sort of thing. And people, we see this constantly in Japanese culture and history that people of lower status um, really, really tended to avoid anything that would lead to them being accused of trying to, you know, assume greater status. So this is a fascinating thing. The society's changed. Maybe there's some things that still exist in this way, but uh, Japan overall has become so much vastly more egalitarian that a lot of this is not really legible anymore for us. Anyone else? <laughs> Sounds like we could sit around the, and have a few drinks and talk more about this. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. lecture will be, I think, January 18th. It will be a virtual talk um, given by Bruce Hamana on Japanese tea. So thank you all for joining us.